As Bob Dylan once wrote, the times, they are changing at the VMAC, and not everybody is a fan of all the changes taking place. Has Mike McDonald gone too far? We're going to be breaking it all down here on our Thursday edition of Locked on Seahawks. You are Locked on Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings 12, this is Corbin Smith, host of the Locked On Seahawks podcast, your daily Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Switching things up a little bit here, one week away from the NFL draft, joined by my co-host, Nick Lee, and a special thanks to all the 12s out there. Whether you're listening in nearby Monroe, Washington, or down in Nick's neck of the woods in San Diego, California, we greatly appreciate each and every one of you for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We've got six and a half days until the NFL draft is officially here. First round taking place in Detroit. So we're getting down to the nitty gritty. And as we do each and every year, a week before the draft, we've got our fan driven mock draft. We conducted that today on social media. And Nick and I are going to be diving into all of the picks, all the trades, and of course, handing out our grades for all of those selections and trades. This episode is brought to you away by Monopoly Go. I admit I have a competitive side and I'm a big fan of Monopoly Go. The mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. Join your friends and download Monopoly Go now for free on the App Store or Google Play. Now for your lead story here on our Thursday edition of Locked On Seahawks. Before the start of the show, we always throw our links out there. Main to be, and there's plenty of fans saying, why can't we stop beating a dead horse with the story that came out yesterday from the VMAC, and this was courtesy of Leonard Williams. Going to play that clip here in a second, but the times definitely are changing with Mike McDonald as the head coach, and people should have expected that, but for some reason there are plenty of fans and media members out there that seem to be surprised by this. Let's take a listen to what Leonard Williams had to say, and then uh, we're going to take a deep dive into all the changes taking place at the Seahawks facility. Take a listen. My impressions with the team and with the coaches and with Mike um, as an overall feeling, it, it just you can just tell there's a sense of urgency right now. Um, and in, in a way, that's kind of bringing everyone closer together. That's making everyone, you know, be so locked in and like in meetings and in the in the weight room on the field. It's like you could just tell there's a different sense of like everyone's like locked in on a different level. And I remember the first day we came into the team meeting. Uh, Mike pointed out that you know there's empty walls in the in the hallways and things like that. And um, you know, for a person like me, I think that re made me really excited, and I hope it made the rest of the guys excited because you know we're obviously going to respect tradition and the history of, of the Seahawks, but um, I think it's given us like a clean foundation to like create whatever we want to be. Uh, we're not chasing to like be like any other team that's been here before. We want to create our own identity. So as Leonard Williams mentioned, and I've had the opportunity to go down this hallway dozens of times next to the practice field when I was doing my work as a reporter, and there were a bunch of murals that were up along that wall. You had Richard Sherman's tip. You had Marshawn Lynch running through Saints defenders on the Beast Quake run and a bunch of iconic pictures from the Pete Carroll era. Those all have been taken down. That hallway is a barren wasteland. And I don't think a lot of fans and media members feel this way, but Nick, there has certainly been some pushback over the last 24 hours. Some people wondering, why are we purging history? Why are we getting rid of the tradition? But I know that you and I might feel a little bit differently on this. I'm going to give you the mic first because – you were the driving force behind us talking about this today. And quite frankly, when we're looking at a new head coach with culture and trying to implement locker room ideas, things of that nature, this is actually a pretty important topic, I think. Yeah, basically, I'm hot and bothered that people are hot and bothered about this. <laughs> um, I'm kind of that, that Donald Glover gift that good about this. You know, I'm reading that story because – well, you know, let's say you have, uh, you know, have a, you have a good run with a girlfriend or a boyfriend, um, you know, you're, but for one reason or another, you part ways, you're going in different directions, you fall out of love, you know, you don't have that same fire, but you had some good times together, but you part ways and then you get a new significant other. They move in with you. You think they're going to want pictures of your ex around your house? 
or their clothes hanging around or their stuff in the in the, in the you know the bathroom and the medicine cabinet no of course not duh this happens this is I, I, the the outrage i know it's it's a small percentage but just it just does not make any sense at all you know stop comparing these teams to the past you know even if let's say the seahawks do go win the 2024 you know season super bowl they're going to look a lot different than they did in 2013 with that legion of boom there's going to be some some different identities some different heroes you know different style of play it's not going to be the same so yes of course we can celebrate the past you know it's not like he's taking a wrecking ball to the ring of honor it's not like he's denting or smashing the Super Bowl trophy like Rob Gronkowski did to his that one time when he was hitting a baseball with it. You know, he's not like desecrating the history of, you know, what they accomplished. It's, I, I have no, I mean, coaches change up all the time. You saw on Hard Knocks um, with the Jets, Robert Sala last year, he, he made this whole wall and, you know, did this whole thing. And it seems like it's a, it's a pretty routine thing to kind of change stuff up. Um, when it's Even the same coach, you know, if they want to try to completely reset, you know, with, uh, you know, try to, you know, start a new era of their own team, even when they're still there. You see you guys change it up all the time. So, yes, of course, celebrate the past. We're still going to love and talking about those Super Bowl teams. Those guys can come back and, and get standing ovations. But it, it, it's simply the new head coach removing any whiff or shadow hanging over of the previous regime. And as he should, it's a new regime. Time to look forward, not back. I mean, it's, any coach would do this. It's it's pretty common sense, you know, and, and I get, you know, those days are gone. And honestly, tell me one thing that deserves to be on a mural that has happened in the last five years. I mean, it, it, it's been it's not just we're talking it's not a couple of years ago. We're talking 10 years ago now that Super Bowl and, you know, seven, eight years now removed from the true LLB era. It is time to move forward with a new regime and form their own identity without any shadow hanging over them. I think it's really easy when you have unprecedented success, which the Seahawks over the last decade, plus with Pete Carroll on the sidelines, that's what they had. It was the most successful era to this point in franchise history. I think when you have that kind of success, it is really easy to become fixated on what the teams of the past did. And I think from Pete Carroll's vantage point, he liked to have those reminders up there like, hey, we accomplished this. We can get back to this point. But from Mike McDonald's perspective, hey, I was not on this staff. I had nothing to do with any of these teams. And I think there's something to be said. I'm saying this from a teacher standpoint. I was a teacher for seven years. If I was going into a classroom that had some stuff up from a previous teacher, do you think I would leave any of that stuff up? No, I'm going to put my own staple on that classroom. And this is really a glorified, highly paid classroom that Mike McDonald's taking over here. He's got to get a bunch of different guys to buy into the same mindset as a team. And I think walking down that hallway all the times that I have, you know, I could maybe see why some players would walk down that hallway and think, man, they want me to be the next Michael Bennett or they want me to be the next Russell Wilson, or they want me to be the next Richard Sherman or Marshawn Lynch. That is impossible to ask these guys to do. Embrace their own talents, embrace their own skill sets, embrace their own identity. And I think there's been so much chasing of ghosts from the past. And I think we can use that term now that it's been a decade. I, I think that there has been chasing of ghosts in the past. And so from Mike McDonald's perspective, this, this is not him putting graffiti over Pete Carroll. This is not him uh, desecrating all of the great things that happened over the last 10 to 12 years in Seattle. In fact, he has the utmost respect for Mike McDonald, but this is his first head coaching job and he is going to manage this team differently. He has said this from day one. I'm not going to pretend to be Pete Carroll. I'm going to be Mike McDonald. And so he's doing things his way. I agree with you that this is a, a non-story. And yet from the sense of culture building, team building. I think it's worth visiting this just from the perspective that he's wanting this clean slate because he wants his guys to buy into his message so that they can maybe get some of their own murals up from winning big games in the postseason. Yeah, that's really what it's all about. Is And it sounds like the players are on board with this. First of all, yep. as you mentioned, this is something that's in the building. It's not like we're not tearing down banners at Lumen Field. This is something that the players see, and I can clearly see the message of, hey, 
you know, nobody on this roster was part of that Super Bowl team. Nobody. So, or even really part of when that LOB era was was even fading. Um, I guess you can argue maybe Jaron Reed, but um, really it's it's all about starting fresh, which this is, and creating your own identity. And yeah, make those plays, make those moments your own. You can be on this wall. You can be that mural that people walk by when you make those huge plays in 2024 and beyond. Go do that yourself. And we can stop talking about Richard Sherman. We can stop talking about Earl Thomas and Cam Chan. I mean, we won't, but, you know, in that same area where, you know, you can you can be that in your own way. And, and so instead of, you know, trying to fit them in a, in a shoebox that we want them to, they can create their own future. Yeah, and I think this really boils down to, and it's all about that own identity thing, instead of trying to be some of these other players, make it that fans want to talk about Leonard Williams, that they want to talk about Reek Woolen. They want to talk about Devin Witherspoon. They want to talk about Geno Smith because they're not going to forget about what happened in the Legion of Boom era. That's that's not going to be forgotten. But at the same time, you just, you've got to stop playing in the past and you've got to start pushing forward, turn that page. And so that's what Mike McDonald's doing. I just, I felt like we had to discuss this because there were a lot of reporters out there. There were a lot of fans out there that were looking at this as disrespectful. This is not disrespectful to Pete Carroll at all. Pete Carroll didn't have Mike Holmgren stuff sitting in the VMAC when he took over. Like this is just normal behavior and there's still a Lombardi trophy in the VMAC. They're not taking the Lombardi out or anything. So I think everybody just got a cool and realized that this is culture building with a new coach. There's going to be many of the things that Pete Carroll had that they want to keep and transition with. But this is a new staff, and Mike McDonald wants his players to buy into him and his philosophy, his vision. So let's make that wall bear, and let's make some of our own moments here with a new era of Seahawks football. Speaking of a new era of Seahawks football, we allowed our listeners to weigh in on who the Seahawks are going to draft this year in the 2022 or 2024 NFL draft. So we're going to get to the first three selections and a big trade as well coming up next year on our Thursday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This episode is brought your way by Yahoo Finance. Let's get straight to the point. You want to grow your portfolio to deal with rising costs of inflation, to pay off your debt or your mortgage, pretty much anything standing in the way of you and your financial freedom. With Yahoo Finance, you can get access to the news, data, and tools that you need in order to reach that financial freedom. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. Whether you're a seasoned investor or you're looking to get extra guidance, Yahoo Finance gives you all the tools and data that you need in one place. They are number one in finance destination, producing a holistic look at the financial news cycle, breaking news, original editorial perspectives, analyst ratings, customizable charts, and much more. Securely link your brokerage accounts for a unified view of your wealth, including a 401k and other investments. A comprehensive perspective is what sets apart great investors, and it's how Yahoo Finance ensures you have the insight to look at your wealth in its entirety. For comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com, the number one financial destination, yahoofinance.com. That's yahoofinance.com. You're listening to the Thursday edition of Locked on Seahawks. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. Glad to be joined on today's show by my co-host, Nick Lee. And a special thanks to all the 12s out there. Thank you for making Locked on Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. The draft is officially one week away. And as we do every year at the one week's eve, we have an annual fan-driven mock draft we do on social media. We let you, the listeners, decide who the Seahawks are going to pick, what trades John Schneider is going to make. And we're going to start this process off with a trade. And I actually posted three trade options for our listeners, Nick, and ultimately they took a deal from the Philadelphia Eagles to move down from number 16 to number 22 and acquire an additional second round pick at pick number 53. A lot of fans have been saying that that is an unrealistic trade, but the Eagles have two second round picks. They badly need a corner. So if the top one or two corners are there at number 16, this seems like a very realistic trade, and I would give the Seahawks a rock-solid A if they're able to get this haul back and recoup a second-round pick. 
Yeah, well, I have a dad and a brother who are diehard Eagles. They would probably trade their entire draft for a first-round corner at this point. They are disgusted with the pass defense for the Eagles. So, um, yeah, from that perspective, because we, we've talked all the time about, yeah, it's all fun and games to do these mock trades, but the team trading up needs to – it needs to make sense for them too. And then this, I think it does. And then you look at the Rich Hill model with, you know, the the, the value, and it really favors the Seahawks. I mean, it was, a, like you said, maybe a touch – rich um, for the Eagles, but it really favors the Seahawks um, moving back six spots to kind of pretty much create a second round pick out of thin air certainly is nice. So yeah, solid a, if, if the Seahawks pull this off, there were a few trade offers at 22 and I could see things playing out this way that this could be a year where John Schneider has a tough time, not trading down twice in the first round, because there could be a lot of movement in that back half of the round but fans voted to stick at number 22. And with the 22nd selection in our fan-driven draft, the Seattle Seahawks select Byron Murphy, the second defensive tackle out of Texas. Nick, I think if they could get Murphy at pick number 22, that this would be a home run. This may be the best player available on the board at that point. We're talking a player that has elite athleticism at 300 pounds, can be a game wrecker as far as a one-gap penetrator against the run and as a pass rusher. I would give this a solid A-, minus, maybe an A. I'll go A- minus just because I still think there's some untapped pass rushing potential there that hasn't necessarily played out in college. But at pick 22, I don't know that he lasts this long. It's not unrealistic, though. If they can get Byron Murphy here, I think this is excellent value for the Seahawks, and it's truly the best player available picked here rather than basing it just off needs. Right. So if you look at the Pro Football Focus mock simulator, um, they have Murphy as the 12th on their big board, number 12, and then their average draft position ADP at 18.4. So yeah. the fact that the Seahawks are getting him at 22 here, obviously some good value, really strong arms, explosive. You know, I watched him wreck my BYU Cougars there for a bit. Um, yeah. The Big 12, I mean, he's just really a, a, a strong, solid dude. Can bounce around the defensive line. I like that he could learn from Leonard Williams, learn from Jaron Reed, kind of in that mix there in the interior, bounce him around. Um, I'm going to give it a B plus because I do like the player. My only gripe with that is maybe they could have gotten, I don't, I wasn't paying attention to who was on the board, but maybe a stronger, you know, a higher priority need. Cause it's weird to think now, but for me, at least interior defensive line still or now is not like the number one, you know, DEFCON one need. And to get at number 22, if there is some, a Troy Fautano or a Jackson Powers Johnson, something like that. And on the board for 22, I would might've gone there. Um, but solid B plus. I like the player. I like, you know, the, the future he could have with that. And now all of a sudden you put him in that mix in the interior. Holy smokes. The Seahawks have a nasty defensive line. Yeah. Graham Barton and Jackson powers Johnson were both available and they were on the pole, but fans picked Byron Murphy. The second they want that disruptive young defensive lineman. I get it. And, and it makes sense to me. Our next selection, the Seahawks got pick 53 from the Eagles as part of that trade down with that second pick, bringing in a familiar name for Mike McDonald, junior Colson at pick number 53 coming from Michigan. He started as a true freshman for McDonald, 240 plus pounds, Nick. So he's built like a more traditional off ball linebacker. Didn't have a ton of tackles for loss last year, just two of them, two pass breakups. But those stats are misleading because he was playing on the nation's number one defense that was stacked at the defensive line. There were not a lot of opportunities to make splashy plays in the backfield. But when you turn on the film, you can see a guy that has blitzing ability. He is a thumper in the run game, and I think there's a lot of potential for him to make more tackles for loss and those backfield impact plays at the next level. Some might look at this as a little rich. I'm going to give this a B plus just because there were a few players there that maybe overall were a little better and they were coming from positions maybe that are valued a little more. But this draft, Colson's going to go in the middle of the second round. I think that's about the sweet spot. If you want to get one of those top linebackers, Nick, this is where you got to get them. So I'm going to go a B plus on this selection, reuniting Colson with McDonald. Yeah, honestly, I'm a little down on where the Seahawks are at, an off-ball linebacker. Uh, Drum Baker is a decent player. Uh, Terrell H- Dodson has uh, you know some some upside. But I think Junior Colson has the highest ceiling of those three. 
And, um, you know, they desperately need a future at linebacker because right now that future is very murky. Um, he's stout against the run, but also doesn't give up, you know, doesn't compensate with a, a poor coverage. Um, and I do see you mentioned, you know, not a lot of tackles for loss, just as pro football focus numbers. He's still kind of towards the three quarters up, upper percentile for average depth of tackle. So he's still in that range, a solid range. Um, I can see him winning a battle to, to start at off ball linebacker as a rookie. I really could see that, especially with this familiarity with Mike McDonald yeah. and that system. So, yeah, I'm going to give an A here. I'm a bit higher on this than you, um, but I do like Colson's game. And, yeah, probably the same. You probably gave that a, a grade, like you mentioned, just because of the people on the board. I think that linebacker is still a pretty big need, um, even with some signings the Seahawks have made. So I, I can see Colson starting day one. We're finally going to get to our first native pick where the Seahawks are going to pick because the first rounder they traded down, second rounder they acquired as part of that trade down. We get to pick number 81, Seattle's native third round pick that they're holding going into this draft. And we have still yet to address the elephant in the room, which is the offensive line. Luckily, our fans knew that and the listeners attacked the offensive line with a player who I am much higher on than a lot of other people are. And that is Dominic Pooney from Kansas. And this guy actually started the Juco route before eventually finding his way to Lawrence. And you look at the numbers the last two seasons. He gave up seven pressures and no sacks in 2022, eight pressures and no sacks last year. And he's playing in the run and gun, shoot him out Big 12 that's got a lot of really good pass rushers too. This guy was a lockdown pass protector. He's got kind of short arms. I anticipate that he is going to be sliding inside at the next level. He's not quite as athletic as some of the other tackle prospects as well, but this guy is an elite pass protector in this class. I, I think at the guard spot that he is going to settle there and he could potentially be a Pro Bowl, potentially an all-pro guy if he lands with the right team. Maybe not the best run blocker in this class, but he's not deficient in that area either. And he can do zone blocking. He can do gap blocking. I'm giving this a solid A because I have a second round grade in Dominic Pooney. If you can get him at 81, a guy who has that tackle background, you can slide him in at guard. It gives you another insurance policy at the tackle spots as well. I would love this pick for a guy that Geno Smith would be happy about having pass protect for him. Yeah, I love that Pooney does have basically a full season under his belt at both uh, left tackle and left guard. Kansas's offense was one of the more fun offenses to watch yep. um, in 2023 college football season. Um, definitely projects better as a guard. I do like that tackle background, like you said, um, some athleticism there and some possible you know emergency swing tackle kind of thing. They desperately need depth in the interior, and I think that Pooney does an excellent job with that. Um, pass pro from the interior is, is something that they're going to need, even though Aaron Donald is no longer with the NFL. I think as all Seahawks fans rejoiced when that news came out, that still is going to be a priority in the, in the, in the NFC West to protect the interior. So Pooning, I think does, um, does project that. I, I do wonder about the run blocking and his average um, draft position on the, on the PFF um, simulator. I have, it has him at 94 and this is 81. So maybe a tad rich, for those, but you said you, you had a second round grade. I'm going to give us a solid B. I think that he could absolutely play a factor in the interior offensive line uh, as a rookie. We're going to get to the day three selections on our annual fan driven draft coming up next year. Don't go away. You're listening to the Thursday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This episode is brought your way by Monopoly Go. We've all been there either as a player or a fan. It's halftime and the scoreboard is not looking good. You're feeling low, not sure your team can pull out the win. That's when you got to dig deep. Lift your head up and say to yourself, time to get back in the game. Pull off some bank heists and take as much of my friend's money as I possibly can. That's right. The smash hit mobile game Monopoly Go lets you compete with all your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire it's the Monopoly you love, but on your phone anytime with tons of new twists, leaderboards to compare your progress with your buddies. There's so much you can do. You can play on countless dynamic Monopoly boards, make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball, charge other players rent for your iconic properties. You can even work with your friends to crack open community chests and in tournament to get extra rewards and climb the leaderboard. So get back out there, put on your game face, and download Monopoly Go now for free on the App Store or on Google Play. 
You're listening to the Thursday edition of Locked on Seahawks. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. Glad to be joined on today's show by my co-host, Nick Lee. And a special thanks to all the 12s tuning in and making Locked on Seahawks your first listen five days a week. Make sure to check out on Locked on Sports today, as well as the Locked on Seahawks channel. We have our annual first round mock draft. You can check out who I selected for the Seahawks at pick number 16. Unfortunately, was not able to trade down. Nobody was giving me reasonable offers, but liked the pick that I made. You can check out all 32 picks on our awesome annual rock mock draft here on the Locked On Podcast Network. So make sure to check that out, Locked On Sports Today on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast. Continuing our annual fan-driven mock draft, the Seahawks making three selections in the first two days, getting Byron Murphy the second at pick number 22, Junior Colson at pick 53 acquired from the Eagles, and then in the third round at pick 81, Dominic Pooney, the guard from Kansas. Let's get to day three in the fourth round. The Seahawks have two fourth rounders and we received a trade offer from, you guessed it, the Denver Broncos that fans simply could not pass up, trading 102 and 235 in the seventh round to get picks 121 and 136, which is the first pick in the fifth round of this year's draft. So two picks for two picks, but Seattle gets to pick earlier with that ladder selection. We accepted that. So our first big move here, our first pick at pick number 118, the other native pick for the Seahawks going into this draft, Malik Mustafa out of Wake Forest selected at pick number 118. Nick, I don't know where you stand on this guy, but he is one of my absolute favorite safeties in this class, not named Cooper DeGene. A little smaller guy, but he's built with a rock-solid frame. He smacks people very aggressive, sometimes to a fault with how he comes up to defend the run. As a blitzer, had a year where he had multiple sacks, 80 tackles last year. Has the ball skills to be able to pick off passes. On day three, fourth round, this is a pick that I love. I'm going to go with an A-minus on this selection. And uh, I think the fans have been listening to our show because this is one of my favorites. Right, and this he kind of, for me, reminds me of a bit of a more refined Mar uh, Marquise Blair from a few years ago, just that heat-seeking missile yep. um, tackler. And, yeah, sometimes to a uh, fault, um, he, he definitely projects as a run defense first kind of box safety. Could compete with Rayshon Jenkins in that strong safety route event. eventually if he can round out his game. Definitely projects as a type of player that, you know, Jamal Adams kind of was as well, um, that, that tackle run first uh, safety. but. I think he also does project better in coverage than some of those guys. And, and you know, hopefully they can stash him and, and, and teach him those ways. And, and my, under Mike McDonald could possibly develop into a fine starting safety. Um, this is a bit earlier than I, I, most people have. Um, I think his, his ADP, <clears throat> his average draft position on, on the pro football focus side was 161. And this is at 118. So I'm going to give us a B plus. I really like the player. Obviously, some some downfalls, and and this is day three now. We we know what we're picking traits. We're picking potential. Um, maybe even at worst, a special teams guy. Malik Mustafa has the goods as far as being a physical, you know, dominant run defender. Going to pick one twenty one. One of the selections that we acquired from the Denver Broncos in this fan driven draft. What's nice about this is you get two picks in a four pick span. Coming in at pick number one. 21 Seahawk fans doubling up at the guard spot. And Nick, I know I see you over there. Uh, very excited about this selection uh, to me, Mason McCormick from South Dakota state. If you can get this kid in the fourth round, I'd be feeling pretty darn good. And I know he's coming from an FCS school. So there's the jump in competition that he's going to have to deal with. But this guy was impressive at the senior bowl. So we've already gotten to see him against top competition from Power 5 schools, and he held his own. Gave up three pressures and no sacks all of last year as a guard. I don't care what level you're at. That is phenomenal, almost a 100% pass blocking efficiency rate. And oh, by the way, he's a freak athlete. If you've seen his relative athletic score, it is one of the best by a guard all time. So you're talking about a great athlete, a guy that's played a lot of snaps. He was at South Dakota State for six years played in the Senior Bowl, and maybe you don't have to start in day one, but he can learn behind Lake and Tomlinson, and I think there's a long-term starter in this kid. So you get him and Dominic Pooney. Those could be your two guards moving forward to go with Charles Cross and Abraham Lucas 
And that would be a really fun young offensive line. I'm going to give this a B plus because again, this is a guy that I value higher than this. And this is a huge area of need. He's a great athlete that also punishes people really look good at the senior bowl. Uh, we know the Seahawks value that as much as anybody. Uh, to me, this is a this is a prototypical Seahawks pick that makes a lot of sense in the fourth round. Well, Pro Football Focus has him as a top hundred prospect, and yep. He's getting good. him at one twenty one here is it, pretty solid. So I might surprise you a little bit here. Um, I, I do like that he's a durable, pass pro savvy. I, I'm just I, I'm taking this draft as a whole as as a, a living thing, um, and I'm not super crazy about drafting. Uh, uh, two guys that project as guards. I would have liked to see maybe one of them be a center or a swing tackle and, and get develop that depth depth elsewhere. Corbick has played center before. True, that's true. He has. So I guess th- we, we could do that too as well. But I'm going to give us a B. Uh, I, I do. I'm not going to you know do jumping jacks and cartwheels over it. But I do think this is a a possible starting you know interior lineman on day three, which you can never really shake your head at. So. Um, while maybe there were some options to to expand the depth of the offensive line elsewhere, I do like his game. Our next pick, the second one coming from the Broncos in that trade down, pick 136, the first selection in the fifth round, tight end Theo Johnson from Penn State. Now, Nick, I'm going to be honest with you. I would be stunned if Theo Johnson is available at this stage of the draft. With his athleticism, his size, the fact he had almost 350 receiving yards and seven touchdowns last year, he is a willing and capable blocker. I'm going to give this an A just because I ha- I don't see how he's there. And if he is, this is a home run selection. But I have this is the first time here really where I have real skepticism that this player would actually be available at this position. So love the player, love the upside, the red zone ability. They need another tight end. If they can get him at this point, great. I would have loved this pick about two rounds ago. So if you can get him here, incredible value. Well, actually, Pro Football Focus disagrees with you. They have him at 135, which is right where they have him. So um, there, there's some disparity there, and we can go on and on about how Pro Football Focus and you disagree, but that's another podcast for a different day. Um, <laughs> that but, would take like three hours to go through. I, know. I just like it as a reference point, you know, for, for, for listeners, even though they're not they're not the you know the gospel of everything, but I do like it as a reference point. Yeah. For Theo Johnson, 6'6, six, six, over 260. He, he does kind of project a little bit as a Noah Fant type. He's got the athleticism, the red zone threat. Not the most well, – I was surprised because he's not the most blue-collar blocking tight end out of Penn State. You'd think, you know, that that's, that's kind of the, their mojo there, but not quite for his game. But I do like, you know, the, all the other things that come with um, and being an athletic tight end. So I could see him there. Uh, yeah, if, if they do find a way to get him in the fifth round at 136, um, you know, he could definitely be – the heir apparent to Noah fan or slot him in there right away. Um, I'm not jazzed about the depth at tight end for the Seahawks. So I think finding a guy like him, he could definitely find his way on the field, making some catches in his rookie year. We've got two more selections. And just like day three goes anyway, where basically if you blink, you miss six selections. We're going to look at these last two picks real quick. And for the Seahawks in the sixth round, they've got two sixth rounders at pick number 179. Our listeners decided to go the quarterback route. Joe Milton, the cannon-armed, uber-athletic signal caller from Tennessee, 20 touchdowns to the air, seven rushing touchdowns a year ago. And with our other selection in the sixth round, 192, Mo Camara from Colorado State. Nick, I know that you are a huge fan of this kid, and why wouldn't you be? 13 sacks last year for the Rams, and he nearly beat the Colorado Buffaloes by himself in that primetime thriller. He was unblockable in that game. So I think if you can get him in the sixth round, I'd be stunned. But he's not the biggest defensive end, so it's possible he could slip to this stage of the draft. I would give that pick an A. Milton, I'm going to surprise some listeners. Yeah, you could say there's value here. But I'm going to go with a C because I just I look at the film and I see a quarterback with poor decision-making a lot of the time. I have questions about what he's going to be able to do in this system. And is he better than Sam Howell? No. Are you going to keep three quarterbacks? No. If you try to slip into the practice squad, somebody else is going to take him. So this is probably the pick I I least, that I'm least fond of, even though I think it would be good value. I just don't think if the Seahawks are going to take a quarterback, it needs to be somebody that's going to be a franchise quarterback caliber guy. And I just don't see that in Joe Milton, and I don't know where a third quarterback fits in for this team. 
Right. Milton has an absolute naval battleship cannon, like anti-aircraft cannon. The problem is he also points it at the tugboat that's right next to the boat. He does not <laughs> have the touch. <laughs> I'm going to go C-minus with that as well. I don't know why you pick a project quarterback when you have other needs, when you have Sam Howell. Um, Mo Kamara, I love him. A here. That's, he's my Theo Johnson as far as, wow, he's here at this moment. Um, so getting him in the sixth round, violent hands, college production for days. Give me Mo Kamara. That round six would be – I'd be ecstatic. Yeah, I think both these players are talented. I just – I look at the fit for Milton and I just – it leaves me scratching my bald head a little bit because I just don't know where he's going to fit in. And the physical tools are obviously there, but I just – I have some reservations. And quite frankly, I think Sam Howell is a much better player than what he is. So if you're going to go with a project QB, make it somebody that you can slip to your practice squad. I just don't think Milton, with because of those tools, I don't think they'd be able to do that. And then you wasted a pick when he could have got – a player at another position. As always, you can follow me on X and Threads at Corbin Smith NFL. You can follow Nick at Nick Lee 51 Make sure to subscribe to Locked on Seahawks on YouTube and wherever you listen to your podcast to make sure you don't miss a single episode. Coming up on tomorrow's Blue Friday show, I'll be riding solo, diving into the real wild cards of round one. Who are some players that John Schneider could pick that would shock Seahawks fandom. I'll be diving into those and answering your mailbag questions to cap off the week. You won't want to miss it. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Thanks for listening. Go Hawks.